farms and homesteads on two separate pieces where he works on making resilient and regenerative food systems. We're really excited to welcome Ben Kwok today because uh, permaculture and organic farming share a lot of common ideals and goals. So if you please give a common ground welcome to Mr. Ben Kwok. years, I was trying to get life going on the slope and nothing was happening. 
So finally, I thought back to this permaculture course I took in college a handful of years before, and I learned about these things called swales. And I figured, well, I got nothing to lose. I'm, I'm really trying to get the slope going. Nothing's working. The idea of taking a little backhoe, which I had behind my tractor at the time, and scratching into this dead, beat up old slope just seemed kind of like the opposite that I was thinking would be a good idea. I studied conservation and ecology in college, and you know, we tend to think that the less you do to a piece of land, the better. And um, so I, I came out there, I figured I had nothing to lose. I was even getting kind of desperate. I spread, sprayed um, even fish emulsion through a hose at one point, watered down, of course, on the slope, nothing happening. So I made a series of three to four swales uh, in an April. This was about six years ago. And starting about six weeks, and I kept seeding, and about six weeks later, all the seed I put out started to take. So I was like, wow, this is interesting, because this didn't happen before. The seed didn't take, it just, I'd spread seed, and there'd be no seed, seedlings from those seed coming up. So the seed started to take, and then by probably about mid-June, I realized something totally different was going on in the slope. And basically, the amount of biomass happening on this part of the slope, this one acre, was already to the point that it could almost size it come, come probably late July. More biomass had started to grow on this slope in three months than had it 20 years before on this, on this particular piece of land. And so I started trying to figure out well, what had gone on. And I knew swales were this thing, this structure that catches all the water, slows it down, spreads it out, and sinks it into the ground. And by poking around a little more, I realized that the, the trajectory of this ecosystem going from dead, dead, and more dead, not doing much for a long time, healing, but maybe very, very slowly, to all of a sudden healing very, very quickly and becoming like decent pasture. Now five years in, this has gone from the least productive part of my property to one of the most. And I realized at the time that that was all because the water was actually running off that slope. I didn't, I didn't, that didn't get into my head until we actually had gone through the process of slowing down, spreading out, and sinking the water. But once we did that and saw the results, I realized, wow, okay, so all that water was running off. Plants aren't stupid, they don't start, and they certainly don't grow, but there's no water, thus no nutrients, no oxygen, no nothing for them in the soil. So then they, they started up and they started to thrive. And now this place could be paid at least twice a year, if not three times. That's pretty amazing when you think about the slope, because I didn't mention something very important. The slope has exposed bedrock throughout it. It's about zero inches to 12 inches of subsoil on bedrock. At no place on the slope is there more than 12 inches of gray clay subsoil to schist, to green mountain schist, to bedrock. So again, to be able to get two to three hangs of biomass off this slope, kind of floored me. I was like, wow, that's, you know, that's behaving like okay ag land down in the Champlain Valley. Um, not, you know, not this shallow piece of bedrock, essentially. Um, so I started to pay attention to the water a little more, needless to say, after doing this. And now this place is, we planted it all up with um, this plant, really neat plant called sea berry, which we really love. Um, plums, there's some pears on this slope, hazelnuts further down. And now this slope is producing all manner, you know, wide variety of of foods and medicines as well serves as pasture and once the animals got there the place really started to take off we rotate intensively rotate um, sheep through the site and did, did for a few years took a took last year off from sheep so we could work on our other property one of the other stories i want to share with you guys is about hurricane irene did you guys get hurricane irene where you live anyone yeah it, got, it did get up in the main as bad as vermont maybe but I know it grazed a good chunk of New England. So we got about six inches of rain in Irene, and parts of Vermont got about 12 inches, and it really wrecked the place. I mean, did a pretty good job of, of taking out a whole town, whole villages, some villages, and a lot of houses, and destroyed, uh, at least to some extent, a lot of farms. Now, on our own little small farm homestead, Hurricane Irene actually was a good thing. And I'll tell you about why. Um, I was, it was coming, and I, I saw that it was on the radar. I was like, oh, all right, this is going to be interesting. This is a real test event for all these permaculture strategies that we apply to the land, things like ponds and paddies even, and swales especially. And so during the storm, it, we got about six inches in 12 hours. I started walking around on the property in the last, when that last inch of rain was coming down. And I walked in the high part of the property, 
where about 20 acres of water comes down onto our 10 acres. So, you know, there's like twice the watershed uphill, and it's mostly forested except for one little house. And I followed the course of the water. There was water flowing everywhere. Little, little rivulets, you know, little areas that you don't even think of as a rivulet were like small creeks at this point. And uh, there was some, there was some silt in the water. There was actually some cloudiness in some of these, as you can imagine, with all this water flowing where it normally doesn't flow. And I walked down to our top pond, the first pond that we built, and the water was a little bit cloudy. And I was like, okay, that's, that's good to see that it's not cloudy or we're not moving that much soil, but we're settling out what soil we are. I went to the pond overflow, followed this spillway, followed the water down to the second pond, which is like 50 vertical feet below that, and there was just a little bit of cloudiness, not much, and the water coming in was mostly clear. And then I kept walking down the property, and by the time I got to the bottom, where there's a little, I call it like a settling pool, it's usually empty. Like this year, it never even filled up because we had a pretty darn dry year. Um, it was completely clear, and it was about five gallons a minute of crystal clear water flowing into this pool. And I was floored. So at that moment, I realized we were filtering and processing and infiltrating and settling out 30 acres of, of six inches of rain, it's 28,000 gallons per inch per acre. I forget the math, I did it at one point, but it's like millions of gallons basically that day, coming down to this steep, beat up old piece of land, and there was zero erosion happening, like not even any, none. Erosion that was happening from the natural forest above us was actually being absorbed by our agricultural system. So there was this ag system, well, I guess it's more of a gardening or homestead system, that was absorbing all of that shock to the system. It was doing very intense regenerative work in a, in a point in time when it was receiving a lot of stress. So I was really, really impressed with this. Um, it, it showed me that our, our human-made systems, our agricultural systems, can not only reduce flooding and floodplains and actually help restore our watersheds that we're in, it's actually holding on to all of our water and slowing and spreading and sinking it, it's really just great for the farm, for the farmer who runs that land, for the homesteader, because never before has there been so much fertility in rainwater, right, because of all of the nitrogen pollution. They say there's more nitrogen now in the rain than there's ever been. So every time it rains, we're receiving a fertility event. So any rain that you're losing off your site you're losing fertility, right? Even if you're not losing soil directly, which usually you are if water's running off your site, because water carries everything. Um, you're actually just losing straight up nutrients, primary of which is, ni is nitrogen, but a lot of other nutrients as well that come down in the form of rain. So this idea of, of doing ecosystem regeneration and restoration while increasing resiliency on a farm and a homestead was made very real that day in Hurricane Irene. Um, the third story I want to chat about um, is a little less spectacular. It's um, it's not it's not quite as, as straightforward as you know absorbing a million acre a million, million acres million uh, gallons of water um, in a in a hurricane, but it's just as important and it's it's a little more subtle. It's really about my own integration with the place and it's really about how. Uh, the food system on this site, which we focus on trying to be a perennial food system, right? We practice permaculture, so we're, we're really interested in, in systems that are uh, permanently producing. Where we don't have to, well, systems that reseed themselves every year and produce for decades or hundreds of years, not just, you know, three seasons. Um, we also do grow vegetables as well, but in annual plants, but uh, that's not our focus. So. This, this story starts with, I was walking down, well, it probably started years ago, but in the last couple of years, it's, it's, um, it's quickened. I was walking down last fall, down by our rice paddies, near some of our terraces where we rotate vegetable staple crops, and um, I saw an oak tree, and it was a white oak, some white oak family tree, you know, with the round lobes, and I was like, I kind of walked past it, and then I turned around, like, wait, what, what, what the hell was that? And because oaks don't grow near us, right? They're not, we don't live, down the Champlain Valley there's oak trees, up in the Green Mountains where we are, there's no real oak trees around and certainly no white oak, white oak family oak trees for probably at least 25, 30 miles in the shortest direction. 
Um, and here was a white oak family tree, and it might actually have been a fir oak that planted itself. And I know, I remember where all the trees are, at least on our smaller piece of property, for the most part I planted. And I know I didn't plant one, I wouldn't plant it immediately south of a vegetable garden, giant oak tree. And yet here's this tree growing there. So I started to think about that. It's like, wow, okay, so the food system here is starting to naturalize itself to this place. Maybe that's what it seems like is happening. And then this summer I was walking around and um, showing our, one of our permaculture courses, the shiitake mushroom laying yard where we grow shiitakes. And it's on like one side of the driveway and we looked at them, we harvested some mushrooms and talked about that. And then we walked further up the driveway towards the main part of the homestead and um, we looked to the left and see this just volcano of mushrooms. up there, but those sure look like shiitakes. So I'm like, hold on, stop, walked up in the woods. And there was a big log, sure enough, that had shiitakes growing out of it. And everyone who was in the permaculture show was like, oh yeah, that's cool, we just saw shiitakes. I was like, no wait, I didn't inoculate this log. You know, you don't understand, this is, this is not, this hasn't happened before here. Here's shiitake growing of its own accord on a log outside the mushroom laying yard. And it's a big log, you know, never drilled the holes and put the shiitake in. So I was like, wow, okay, that's interesting. So here's shiitake mushroom starting to naturalize itself in the woods around our laying yard. And I started to think since then, and, and actually have thought before then about things like the apple, right? It's hard to imagine the apple. It's hard to imagine New England without an apple, right? But the apple's a recent addition, right? Someone with either some foresight or some other reason brought the apple here from um, South South Asia, South Central Asia, Western Asia, and um, now we have this, you know, hugely beneficent species that that just got here in the last few hundred years. That's would be hard to call an artificial part of our landscape, right? It's a naturalized species that's that's not just beneficial for us, but it's incredibly beneficial for all the other species. Many of them that share. Um, this ecosystem with us, um, and you know, it's kind of interesting because this is a, these, some of these were like eureka moments, and then when I think about them, in a lot of ways, it's like, well, that's not really aha, that's like ah, duh, right? That's how humans have gotten here. This isn't this isn't something new, right? Since forever, as long as we've been humans, we've been moving seed of plants that are valuable, or maybe animals, to the places we go. Um, in a very passive way, for the most part, sometimes more active, garden the places we've traveled around the world. And even way before the advent of agriculture, which is very recent, this has been the process, right? This kind of form of, of wild crafting and almost reverse wild crafting across a landscape. So it's funny, kind of, that it, it was surprising to me because this is this is as old as humanity, right? And then. Um, in the last few years especially, I've started to go out to the landscape and notice all of the wild foods, or things we call wild foods, like lamb's quarters, and um, you know, um, dock, and dandelion, and amaranth, and a lot of other wild fungi as well that we, we, we harvest around the landscape. And realize that there's also a food system here that planted itself way before I got here, and continues to plant itself, not just the food system that that we're encouraging and naturalizing, but the system, the natural system that was here that already is offering massive amounts of food and medicine and materials to us if we so choose to first be able to identify these these species and to know how to work with them. Uh, that was another, you know, odd, dumb moment, right? Because that's, that's older, that's way older than agriculture, this idea of, oh, I want to grow X, Y, and Z and let's Let's kill everything in one area and, and grow that, right? Let's just figure out what's here that we can already live off of, or at least try to live off of. So this idea of tending the wild, right, is something very old. It's 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 hundreds of thousands of years old, and and this is how I've started to come across it. Um, and the context of this is is pretty interesting because all of our farms and gardens, or even if you don't have a farm or garden, if you're from this part of the world. Your place, all of our farms and gardens, were old growth forests not long ago, right? Old growth forest is a little bit of an imprecise term, so let me, let's imagine that more clearly. And let me say that again, all of our farms and gardens were old growth forests not long ago. 
very recently. Let's let's try to imagine what that means, because old growth forest is just, again, that's old growth forest, that, that was nice stuff, but now we don't have it. Um, but we're talking about places where a six foot diameter sugar maple rose 100 feet, only to top out beneath a canopy of chestnut. These chestnuts rising up another 50 to 100 feet with diameters of over 10 feet, right? But these are places, this is what these places were, New England, other parts of the world. Right? The largest sugar maple any of us probably have ever seen would be a regular, typical member in the understory of these forests. You know, let's picture this for a moment. Um, this is the kind of love life that covered almost every acre in this part of the world for hundreds of human generations before us. And this wasn't a wilderness, there were people here. Right? So let's just, just keep picturing that that hundred foot tall maple, which is under a chestnut. And this is everywhere, and there's people too. It's not a wilderness. Um, these were lightly tended landscapes. We're just coming to understand this, at least some of us, maybe some of us had known this for, for longer. Um, and these systems only stopped a few generations ago. So the landscape we inhabit today, let's, let's picture that more clearly, and let's understand it for what it is. We're just getting a snapshot of what, of what this world is right now and what it could be. Um, the landscapes we inhabit today are, are, are mere infants of their former selves. We're gardening and farming in, in a stunted system, which is just barely beginning to recover from just two centuries of looting. Right? These old growth forests were just here, and they just went away just within a couple hundred years. So that's the context for our lives, right? If we're trying to make a living, we're trying to work with land, that, that's, the, that's our context, that's, that's what we're working within. You know, that, that just happened and it just went away. Um, and I wanna ask, you know, can these abused landscapes sustain us? Can the landscapes we've inherited, you know, our, the, the, the massive loss, loss of topsoil, my own property, I've inherited subsoil. I haven't inherited topsoil. The topsoil is in the bottom of the ocean. Right, it's, hard, it's hard to get that back out. Um, do we, can these landscapes sustain us? Can we resurrect the systems that evolved here over time? Can we resurrect those old growth forests? Can we resurrect topsoil two feet deep on top of mountains in New England? Right, not subsoil, but topsoil. Um, do, we, do we need this? Do the other creatures need these systems? Do we need them to get by? Um, and will farming, is today's farming, even the best of today's farming, can organic or even what we call sustainable farming get us there? How fast can they get us there? Can they get us to this place fast enough, this resurrection? Can any dependence on annual crops get us there? I must confess, on small parts of my landscape, I too till the earth. I have a vegetable garden. I kill plants, a lot of them, that want to thrive and prop up plants that sometimes would rather die in my vegetable garden. Um, in my vegetable garden, I dominate. I'm not the so beneficent ruler that decides who lives and dies, right? I'm not, I'm not always beneficent. I pull a lot of them out of the ground. I, and I've learned this the hard way, that a while ago, I let a, lot of, let a lot of those other plants live that wanted to live and amidst the ones that I also was thinking I wanted to grow. And I didn't get too many vegetables that year. If you've ever grown a, a weedy vegetable garden, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't work very well. Uh, I keep trying, but it doesn't work very well. <laughs> and though my garden feeds me, feeds me abundantly, sometimes when I'm working there, I notice how against the grain of the ecosystem this activity really is. If I stop tending my garden for even a few short weeks, or in some of the, the garden where it's in better shape, maybe a month or two, the garden slows down, weeds begin to thrive, weeds and vegetables diminish. I'm reminded often that vegetables do not happen of their own accord. And then I step away from the veggie garden, and into the larger garden, the whole of the land that surrounds me, most of the landscape I live on, the grazed perennial polyculture, the food forest of walnuts, pear, apple, cherry, scores of berry, pasture, and many other plants and animals, as well as a lot of wildlife. And despite large lapses of tending these spaces, it's most of my it's most of my land system after all, and I don't tend to most I don't tend to at least half of it every year. Um, these perennial systems keep developing on their own. They want to be here, unlike my vegetable garden. Yesterday I harvested pears from a tree I planted eight years ago. I tended to it until it was above deer brows, and then a little bit more after that. But in the last few years I haven't really touched it. Just like a person, a perennial ecosystem needs some care to get established, then at some point it begins to take on a life of its own. 
and becomes a food producing and medicine producing system or material producing system of its own accord. If you have a chunk of forest, you know what I'm talking about. And as I walk through this developing food pasture woodlot, that's really just part of what it is, a food pasture woodlot. I have a hard time calling it a farm because it's all these different things. I get glimpses here and there of the old growth forest that once was and the old growth food forest that someday will be right here. And as I'm lulled into this contemplation of a beautiful future, my wife calls me back up the hill. We aren't done weeding yet. So I climb back up the hill and think about humanity's track record with this kind of land use. It's not a pretty sight. With farming, with annual agriculture, um, we, rec we recall that civilizations fail not just at the hands of agriculture, but the hands of an organic agriculture. Anything not organic is pretty new. The Fertile Crescent was made into a desert not with the help of Monsanto or Dow or Cargill. Organic farming did that. Now I know we're organic farming differently than that. I'm not talking about the organic farmers here, but I'm talking about organic farming. Or, or how differently is our farming today? Does our organic farming still depend on a bare earth approach? Does our organic agriculture rely on tillage still, requiring us to lay bare the soil, expose it to the inevitable effects of thunderstorms and gravity every year, each and every year, sometimes multiple times? Then I've come to bear some bad news. Doing this is not sustainable, much less regenerative. It may be necessary, certainly we can feed a lot of people very quickly with annual agriculture and there's a crucial role. That has to be said. Um, it's incredible what we can do with annual seeds, both positively and negatively. Uh, you can feed a lot of people and very quickly with tillage-based agriculture. And the people that have figured out how to generate the fertility they need on site while tr using truly solar power traction or crop management like animal and human power are truly uh, one of the most important cutting edge systems. They're at one of the most important cutting edges of food systems today. Get to know your local horse and oxen farmer. You might need them someday. However, it needs to be clear that resetting ecologies to bare dirt each and every year is simply not compatible with evolving complex, diverse, and healthy ecosystems in a place. It's high time to understand what might be a springboard in a transitional step and what might be an ideal. Where do we really need to get to go? Where do we really need to go and how? Um, what are the hybrid forms that we need to utilize to get there? Um, probably like in any endeavor, what we need is going to require multiple approaches, talents, skills, and context. Um, but before we leave the challenges of our current food system model, I want to mention the topic of off-site dependencies uh, really quickly here, bring up some resiliency questions which we might all do well to address, whether it's on our farms or homesteads or just even in our own lives. Who wants to be dependent on someone else to not go hungry? Anyone? Really? Okay, cool. That's great. Uh, who wants to have a machine with a hundred working parts stand between them and their food source? No, I have a tractor, but I definitely don't want it standing between me and my food. Right? Even though it's really cool, it's awesome, and I try to figure out how to get it out of the system every year. I'm not there yet. Maybe, maybe in the next five or ten years. Who wants to depend on a global supply chain of parts to eat their next meal? You sure? No one? No one's raising their hand. All right. I don't either. Um, who wants to depend on a market at all to be fed? Maybe a local market? Okay. Just important questions. We actually go over these questions sometimes with um, clients that we work with in their own, in their own landscape. Um, Richard Heinberg called for a million new farmers, and that is or, or was a timely goal, right? We certainly could use a lot more farmers. But maybe more urgently and for the long haul, what we might need even more of is a billion new gardeners. Let's remember that the world hasn't fed itself for long from farming. We've, set our, we've fed ourselves for a very, very long time from gathering, hunting, gardening, small plots of land, tending the earth in small groups at small scales. Right? That's the backdrop. That's what got us here. Since the advent of agriculture, we've done a remarkably poor job, actually, at feeding ourselves while wrecking the living world at a mind-numbing and impressive rate never seen before agriculture. Only since the advent of agriculture has mass starvation even existed. Indeed, it's not a stretch to say that it is agriculture that has greatly contributed to the most recent mass extinction on planet Earth. 
tough thing to say at an agricultural fair, right? But it's context. Knowing this, what kind of agriculture do we most need today? Actually, let me rephrase that. What kind of food system do we need? And should, should this properly be called agriculture at all? At what scale should it be practiced? How complex can it be? What is manageable? How do we integrate grazing animals into perennial ecosystems? Into perennial polycultures, more precisely. How do we make friends with trees again and work with them as allies in our food system? How do we establish an intergeneration and intergenerational food, fuel, and medicine system that works as elegantly as the forest? How will these systems be economically viable enough to establish and then tend to over the generations required? These are the questions that permaculture is working to address. There are no easy answers to a lot of false hopes. There are real hopes too. The fact that we humans can make a living from perennial-based systems of plants and animals is very hopeful. It's what drives me and my work. The track record we have in living from and through ecosystems that self-reproduce and adapt, uh, that self-reproduce is vast. That's how we got here. Uh, we are tenders, gardeners, not miners. That's what's gotten us to this place in time. And the his our track record there is there for us to explore, replicate, and adapt. Often we need to look at indigenous forms of land use to do this. In fact, we find ourselves at this very moment on a continent right now here in Maine, which manifested this perhaps more than in most places in the world. This was a continental scale food forest, cropped everywhere, but without tillage, and with many, many people. Mostly, it did have straight lines and very little monoculture, if any at all. In agriculture, or do I mean a garden, is what this place was, that happened to look like a chestnut forest or an oak forest. When we think about the indigenous systems of land management I'm referring to, we're reminded that a garden can be 100 acres. A garden actually can be the size of the entire North Woods or North America. Perhaps it's not the scale that should define the term gardening, but the sort of relationship engaged in. Aldo Leopold said a farmer is one that determines the plants and animals he shares his home with. Perhaps a gardener is one who chooses to live and also let live, to choose for some species and also choose against others, but on the whole establish and then promote the most diverse, productive, and robust system, not just for ourselves, but for the, living, the rest of the living systems of that place to get a yield while supporting the evolution of an ecosystem. That's what we call permaculture. There's a lot we don't know about how to do this, but the part I find most compelling is this. We know that it's been done before. Actually, it's what's got us to this place over the long haul. It's what's gotten humanity here over the ages. Accepting in the very re recent eye blink in human evolution, deep connection to and a mutually beneficial participation within our ecosystems is simply what we're made of. If it wasn't, we would not be here today. We've forgotten much indeed. The remembering might take a while, but fortunately we can begin and can continue right now in our gardens. And with the collective experience, wisdom, and projects found right here, right now, we are hot on the trail of clues towards, begin, again, becoming native to our places. Thanks a lot. I'll hang out for questions and comments. but I know I'm really thankful that he's here for those inspirational words. Thank you, Ben, and that you're a part of the Common Ground community. And we wanted to give you this Common Ground Country Fair shirt for today as a awesome. thank you, too, for being a keynote. I respect greatly, and you're always wearing these shirts. <laughs> now I guess I get to wear one, too. Yeah. And we do have one of our local main booksellers here, and has some of
question was there's a wealth of food resources all around um, and where but where are the monetary resources for young people that, that because it takes some money sometimes to, to get stuff going um, well there's there's as much I think as much waste as there is in the world there's money too um, I mean they go hand in hand right so I see I mean, there's massive quantities of wealth. It's just not distributed very well, right? It's just more centralized than it's ever been. So sometimes the most um, the most advanced and, and forward moving and quickly moving per, per productive projects I see are tapping into some of those stagnations of wealth. Um, whether it's you know a philanthropic organization helping stimulate something, you know, getting some land so that some people can get a project going, um, or it's people working for a wealthy landowner and, and doing something really awesome on some of the m many acres that are underutilized, you know, in um, around the world in New England especially. Um, it's it's I think it's all over, and I'm not saying it's easy to access, but there's. There's a ton of wealth around. It just has to be found, and even it's stagnated. You know, I don't. I don't think I've. We've had about 200 clients in New England, and I don't think I've had one that doesn't have way more land than they could use well. You know, it's just excess resources. That's everywhere. So the, the young people I've known who, who have tapped into this figure out a way to be somewhat useful to those landowners or to those situations while also establishing a project for themselves. Um, I don't. I don't have any easy answers on how to do that, but yeah. Good, that's an easy one. <laughs> what are my favorite plants? What are some of them that, that I would like to share about? Um, well, the first one is um, sea berry. Sea buckthorn, people call it, I don't like to call it that because it's not related to buckthorn, the ram, ramnoides, or, or it's not related to ramness. Um, it's uh, Hippophae ramnoides, and it's uh, Siberian sea berry, some people call it sea buckthorn. It's, native to, well it's now becoming native to, to North America fortunately, but it's native and has been for a long time to north, all the like northern Europe and Asia. It's actually endangered in Hungary because it's over harvested so heavily. It's a nitrogen fixing fruit and it's loaded with essential fatty, fatty acids so it actually puts more back into the soil than it takes while producing an awesome yield. It's permaculture, right, in a, in a plant, in plant form. We love nitrient fixers, and here's one that, that fixes, that um, actually produces a, a nutrient dense, like nutraceutical quality berry. And um, it's like, a, it actually has a function in the landscape, a lot like autumn berry, autumn olive, but um, it doesn't tend to disperse so readily, or at all. I mean, it runners a little, but doesn't disperse from seed, and what we've seen. Um, it grows anywhere that's, I mean, it just needs full sun, and it's t almost totally drought proof. It's salt tolerant, it's like halophilic, it can grow on a pile of sand, basically, if you mulch it up and get it some full sun in this climate. And it'll form a living hedge. You can hedge them together if they're males and females. They're awesome. They're slow to harvest, but they're medicines. You don't need a whole lot. They're loaded with like omega-7 and omega-3 fats. A lot of stuff you can't normally get. They're like a fish on a plant in some ways, nutritionally. Um, we also like elderberry. Uh, sea berry you can get... Um, there's a, actually a farm in Maine called Fox Green Farms, which is really doing a lot of work with it. And they provide seed, I think, at least. And we provide plants. And there's a handful of nurseries around the country providing plants. Um, we provide cyan wood as well. Um, elderberry is a great one. Um, most folks know elderberry. It'll grow on its own. You don't have to baby it along. We like black currants as well, but they take a lot more care than like an elderberry or sea berry. Um, you know, any nut tree that you can get to grow on your site is a good one. Um, you know, it's fat and protein on a tree that produces with, without having to, it's like a cow grown, it's like a cow that'll produce for 200 years without having to be fed, right? That's kind of like what a nut tree is in terms of what it does in a system. Uh, chestnuts more full of carbohydrates than fat and protein, but the other nuts are generally full of fat and protein. 
Um, in this part of the world, in the North Woods, you know, pine nut, Siberian stone pine, and Korean nut pine could be like a totem tree. Could be like our apple in the long run. Um, we need to get those systems established because they take 10, 20 years to bear, but then they bear for 400 years. And they're, you know, I mean, it's not a coincidence the, the Russian Olympic Olympic team is fed on a diet very high in pine nut oil and pine nuts as well as sea berry. You know, they, they know these plants. They're, they're, um, pine, a lot of pine nuts are native to the taiga region of Siberia, you know, cover millions of acres in that area. Um, those are, I think those are some of our favorites right now. Yeah. Are you growing aronia or chisandra? Yeah, we, we do grow aronia and chisandra as well, and those are those are great ones too. We're not as far along with chisandra, but that's a really important medicinal. Um, and aronia berry is great. I mean, we'll plant those in the berms of ponds, pond berms, like intentionally compacted soil. It'll grow. It doesn't root very deeply, so we're not concerned with it. And we'll we'll line it out all over really rough soil. Aronia berry. It's not it's not the tastiest thing in the world, but it's great for medicines. We'll treat it like elderberry and mix it in with elderberry syrup. Anything that's dark purple like that, you know, it's full of like anthocyanins. It's really rich in um, a lot of anti-cancer compounds. Yeah. Yeah. Do questions just about soil, soils, re soil remineralization, um, testing. We, we do test our soils a bit. We're, we're doing that more and more as time goes on, especially with our larger site. Um, and remineralizing, remineralizing is definitely something we do. Um, we do add, you know, green sand and azomite early on, like a one-time amendment. You know, when we establish, when we dig a swale, we'll mix that in one time. You know, it's not an ongoing amendment, but if it's available, you know, one of our approaches is like, if it's available right now and it can be turned toward the trajectory of regeneration, like even if it's a little diesel fuel to run an excavator to change the subtle shape of a slope so that then that slope is high functioning until the next ice age, we'll make the decision to do that. So um, I think some rock dust and procuring some off-site inoculants in that way is is a smart thing to do. But we're lucky, you know, we're lucky that we have a lot of bedrock, so we have a lot of minerals. You know, our system is essentially mining the bedrock out constantly. Yeah. Do you do anything as far as uh Remediation, and absolutely, we're always promoting mycelium, and that's kind of the way I think of it: is is um, working with fungi and working with the mycelium, the roots of the fungi, and that's just something that now has become kind of second nature on our site. But by mulching, basically, if you mulch with wood chips anywhere, and you add fungal inoculants, what we've used primarily is wine cap strafaria, strafaria rugosa annulata. We we originally planted like a few hundred trees bare root into our site and mulch them with wood chips, which we just try to get for free, you know, when the local folks, arborists are pruning power lines and stuff, we always try to get these wood chips and um, put those wood chips around and the first, a year later, during the summer, all these mushrooms started coming up and I didn't know what they were and a friend came by and was like, oh, those are, um, why aren't you eating your wine caps, you know, those are awesome mushrooms. I was like, well, I, I never heard about them. So I started looking into them. And basically, this, this mycelium is everywhere now on our site. We found the white mycelial mass originally in a few spots. It probably came in on our, on our root dips that we root dip our plants with, which is in this just total matrix, the biological cocktail of beneficial organisms, mycorrhizal. It's like, it's, like the bio, it's like the living remineralization, right? It's just lots of organisms that you bomb your site with when you plant trees. And um, so we started getting this mycelium, and then we just grab up some, use it like a like a kombucha culture, right? Like a mother. Grab up some, put it into anywhere there's new woody debris. It could even be slash logging debris. And so now we have that mycelium literally everywhere throughout the site. Even in the, like places that are grass that I like 
side that's grass or mow a few spots, there'll be that mycelium coming in from the bases of trees into the grass. And we've seen wine caps that grow in the lawn. They're not a lot of lawn, but there's some, and they grow right up in it. So I think the whole site is now a, a one matrix of this my of a mycelium mat of wine caps, Trafaria. Uh, and that probably has a lot of benefits we don't even know about, but people like Paul Stamets, which you refer to, um, articulate very well in terms of the ecosystem resilience of that whole site. They, they're, they're coming to an understanding, scientists are, that mycelium can like move not just materials and, and moisture and nutrients, but also information across the landscape over huge distances, like thousands of feet or maybe even longer, to distribute um, different accesses from one area to another and increase the overall ecosystemic resiliency in the place. Yeah. What, if, what about using um, wood chips that are from pines compared to hardwoods? Yeah, wood chips compared from pines compared to hardwoods. My my view is that all wood chips are good wood chips. If you can get them, spread them on your site. It's so it's free soil. It's free life, free biology. Just just get any and all. I mean, if you if you have a pile of like black walnut wood chips, I'd still get them. But I mean, you're not gonna no one's gonna chip a big black walnut tree. But you know, they'll slow down a little. They'll slow. They'll be a slower to um, to turn into living living stuff, but, yeah. Uh, so, how, how long did it, how long did you establish your pasture before you started to run your sheep on it? Um, how long did we establish pasture before we ran sheep? Well, some of it, like, was already just a banded field, and that was, like, ready for sheep right off. Um, with two to three months after seeding an area that's really disturbed, sometimes we can have it ready for sheep. One season, you know, just enough. I mean, it depends on the angle of the land, you know, how steep it is. If it's steeper, it needs, you know, m a m more sod to prevent pugging and, you know, erosion. And are, are you rotating them through the through, through your flat terraces, or are you rotating them through the sloping? Yeah, well, we when we had we had we didn't have sheep this last year, but when we had them for a few years. We rotated them like everywhere through with Electronet, and it's a total pain in the ass. It was a nightmare. That's why we had to take a week, uh, a week, a year off. Um, it's awesome what it did, but rotating Electronet through a perennial polyculture with trees and shrubs everywhere, this three-dimensional system. I mean, it's good if you wanna if you wanna trip on the Electronet and actually wrap yourself up in it and get stuck. It's awesome for that. But no, but really, that's one of the challenges, right? It's not something we've yet. Well, we have figured out better ways. They're called cows and geese, but um, and and you know, elect poly wire, not electronet. But it works great. It's just labor intensive. And but some of these systems, I think, are going to be labor intensive for a few years, and then they can be fenced in with more permanent fencing. The sheep aren't going to, you know, once you give a, a woody perennial three, four years, get it above deer brows, you can you can often, depending on the sheep and depending on the plant, have them coexist together. Goats bigger challenge. degraded 
land that has no sod and just has some, you know, some brambles, then that's one advantage of that is there's not going to be a lot of weeds coming through and competing with the tree. We also, you know, so plant a lot of things like comfrey, baptisia, dock, we'll promote, you know, there's a lot of understory plants that we like to use in permaculture to keep, keep the sod down, promote the tree. Yeah. I found an answer to this a couple of years ago. If you have um, pure sawdust, pure carbon sawdust, 23 pounds of actual nitrogen per ton of sawdust, and you'll balance it out. Okay. Good info. So this guy said he's figured out that 23 pounds of, of nitrogen will balance out a ton of sawdust, of fresh sawdust. So that'll, that'll knock out that nitrogen sucking sound that you hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, wood chips along a roadway, you know, yeah, there'll probably be some like benzene in there, maybe there could be some contamination. Um, depends how busy the roadway is and everything else, but um, depends on a lot of, a lot of things. I, it's not ideal, but I mean, there's more mercury in the trees now than ever before just because there's more mercury in the rain. I mean, you could be up in north of Moosehead Lake and there's going to be more mercury in the rain in a place that's really far from industrial pollution. Yeah. Um, that's just, it's all contaminated to some extent. So that's what we need, the mycelium everywhere and everything else everywhere. So unfortunately we only have room for one more question for Ben, but maybe he'll stick around later on to answer questions, if you guys have them. Yeah. Decided straw, what to do with it. Um, I would try to test some mushrooms on it off site, wherever it was contaminated, and see if you could get stuff to live on it. And if not, maybe not bring it on site. Um, I mean, usually most things, even to real toxic stuff, will break down eventually with enough presence of life there. But, you know. Oh, you already used it on site. You're bringing the, bringing the mushrooms in. Bring the mycelium, find some mushroom and I'm going to get it from friends. Stravaria, oyster, um, wine ca or, well, wine caps of Stravaria, um, Trevise, Versicolor. I mean, you know, get like 10 species of mushroom on site. Um, get as much life growing in it as you possibly can. See, get those carbon pathways going. And, you know, it's life that decontaminates something. Thank you, man. Yeah. I hope you hear some more. Sure. Thanks. <laughs>